Hi, welcome to Exploring the Illusion of Free Will. My name is George, and today we're going to be talking about human will and the Occupy Global Revolution. Okay, um, basically what we're, we're going to do is just trace the causal chain of events that have led to this global revolution and then kind of explore what it means, what, what the revolution and its aftermath will mean um, to to, to the world and actually how we can use the causal perspective to go through this very, it's going to be a challenging phase in human history, but to go through it in actually the most civilized and, and pleasant way possible. Um, okay, <laughs> so this, is a, this is an exciting show because this is like one of the reasons, you know, like today, um, you know, I did, this is the third of three shows I've taped, and like I'm doing these without notes, you know, just with the title of the show. Um, and part of it is because like my, my attention has been so drawn to what's going on with this Occupy. You know, I've been going down to Liberty Square um, and all. And so like, but, but you know, I do recognize that this is a very, very important topic to what's going on. So, so that's why I'm doing this show. And, all right, let's begin. Uh, I haven't gotten to the point where I've, like, you know, poured over the, um, the history of it, you know, exactly. From what I know, all right, basically, we can go back to, let's say, Tunisia with this. You know, um, I think it was a, um, a street vendor who, if, if the account that I heard was correct, I think he was insulted by... Uh, by a police officer or something, he became very distraught. I think he was like, um, I, I think it was economy based or whatever. I don't know, but anyway, I think he, I think he set fire to himself. You know, very tragically. It was very, you know, very unfortunately. But then, you know, what happened is because of that, um, then Tunisians started to demonstrate, started to protest, and then like they toppled the, you know. The, the leaders of Tunisia. Then, then in Egypt, they, they said, wait a minute, if, if the Tunisian people can do that, you know, against their corrupt leaders, we can do that against our corrupt leaders too. So they took down Mubarak. And then in Libya, they felt the same thing. And they took down uh, Gaddafi. And then this has been going on in, in Iran and, um, and Saudi Arabia. And it's, it's now all over the world. I mean, you know, they had riots in, um, in Italy and London. And so now, now we're like, and this is all causal. In other words, you know, what this one person did, you know, just set, set in motion this whole chain of events that are, that is leading to, to, um, you know, new world. So, you know, actually when, you know, God, you know, again, um, I, I would never encourage anyone to, um, to, um, you know, light themselves on fire or something for, for whatever, but, but just, this just shows you, don't, don't let anyone like tell you that as one person you can't, you know, change the world because you can, um, you know, like, um, Mark Zuckerberg changed the world with Facebook because Facebook was instrumental in all this. All right. Um, so, so then, you know, we've got these like the Arab Spring, the Arab Awakening that happened, you know. And then, then what happened was there was a, an activist organization in Canada called Adbusters. They, um, they have a magazine too, and they launch activist campaigns. So they thought it would be a good idea if protesters were to occupy Wall Street, a park in Wall Street. And... Um, and then they got together with another group who got the idea that, fine, well, you know, who is it going to be that we're protesting with and who is it going to be that we're protesting against? Because um, traditionally, a lot of times in, in American politics, it's about parties. It's about the Democrats versus the Republicans, or it's about government. It's about the government, you know, whatever. But so they decided to take a different tack on this. They decided to have this be a revolution of the 99% against the top 1% who essentially control the politics of the world and the economy of the world. And, you know, by that are responsible for so much unnecessary suffering that comes about from the inequality that they've created, you know, the, um, the global inequality. So... Um, all right, so, 
So, and so that was genius. That was brilliant. You know, 99 versus one. You know, again, we've already won. They're, they, they, you know, the, um, and the reason I say this, that the, uh, the occupation, the revolution really already is won. It's just going to, at least in the United States, um, is that, um, okay, this is interesting. Uh, yeah, I want to get very creative in this. Um, it's, it's fascinating how, how co what causes or what reasons um, then um, result in, in what outcomes. Um, for example, for, for the several two, three, four, however many million years that, um, that we've been human beings on the planet, um, you know, when, when a girl is, um, when a woman is, is 13, when a girl becomes a woman, I guess, at 13, when, when, when they become capable of procreating, um, it generally wasn't much after that that traditionally over these several million years that, you know, young women began to have families then. That's, you know, the hormones were kicking in, the, the, the physiology was like preparing them to, to give birth and all, to start families. That's, that's how we're conditioned. Okay, now, you know, just zoom into now the, the last two, 100 years or so, um, that that historical model of, of women, you know, beginning to, to raise families at 14, 15 is, is you know, in, in a lot of the world, at least in, in the developed world, the first world, it's not really um, the way things are anymore. First, you know, you have um, women, young women encouraged to first wait until they have, let's say, graduated high school, okay? But ideally, they're encouraged to wait until, you know, they've maybe graduated college and maybe they're into the, let's say they're, you know, mid-20s or 30s, whatever. Basically, women are postponing starting a, a, a family because there's this kind of a contract that they have with society that they, you know, society says, listen, um, get an education. You know, get an education. You can make more money. Um, you can have a better life if you, um, you know, have an education and that will make things easier. And so what's happened, I mean, what I'm trying to say is that like the 2008 global recession that, um, that has cost so many people jobs, I think it's affecting this particular population, these young women who like, I think basically this is horm hormonal, this is like physiological, their bodies, their psyches, their basic beings is telling them no. We are not going to wait um, another five years to start having a family because some 1% of the population want to like take, what, over 30% of the wealth of, of, of the world, you know, or, and, and just completely control the, the governmental policies, which they do, you know, with that money. Um, these, these women naturally are not looking at the political implications of this. These women just want to like have kids. They want to start having their families and that, that probably, um, more than, I don't know, perhaps anything, I don't know, who knows, but that's, that's probably a very, very um, telling and salient reason why the revolution has already been won, because, you know, these, these women are in the same situation. And again, like, you know, in some of the poor, if they succeeded this in some of the poor countries like Libya and Tunisia and Egypt, we can't but succeed with this in the United States and Europe because we have such higher standards. In other words, you know, um, the women in these developed countries are not going to wait five, ten years, you know, whereas like in poorer countries, because of the poverty and lack of empowerment that that, um, that comes with it, they, you know, they might more likely, but as, as we saw, since they didn't, then it, you know, stands a reason that, um, that American and European and probably Asian and, you know, yeah, women all the, all the world, South American women, you know, African women, you know. Yeah, so anyway, so, so this is a very, very interesting kind of a causal causal conditioning that happens you know causal um because you know we're biologically um hardwired to start families at a certain age and because we're only women will only tolerate a certain amount of delay in that and because the economy isn't expected to improve anytime soon you know, you've got, a su you've got a successful global revolution of the 99% by, you know, uh, against the 1%. You know, it's not going to go away. It's not going to fail because these women are going to raise their families. 
Um, and there's more to it than that, of course. But all right. So, but what does this mean? What is what will it mean um, relative to this question of human will um, as we progress? As we as we you know, basically, I guess in steps and stages, you know, begin the process of taking the power and and, and the money from the one percent. Um, well, if we adopt a free will perspective. It's not going to be very pleasant for anyone because we, the 99%, would be justified in, in blaming the 1% and in condemning them and in just like, you know, claiming they're just evil and reckless and, um, and selfish and greedy, which they are. But under the free will perspective, we blame them for that. We hold them accountable. And naturally, you know, they must, a lot of them must be scared out of their minds, you know, in terms of like thinking about the future because they don't want the 99% just like, you know, um, aggressing you know, politically, psychologically, economically, whatever, God willing, not um, physically, but, you know, they don't want to be in that position. Um, we, the 99%, uh, we don't want to be in the position of having to blame individuals and groups of individuals as we go about the process of, of making the, li um, the world more equal, fairer, and you know, more pleasant. So um, that'll tell you everything. That will tell you everything. I mean, like, to the extent that we um, understand that, that human will is not free, that it's causal, then we can proceed with this revolution in the most civilized way possible. Um, Okay, I talked about this a bit in the show before this. Um, this revolution is, yes, about, you know, young kids wanting a future, wanting to, you know, progress with their life dreams. But um, it's also about equality. It's also about, you know, how wrong it is for people to think that the right of them, for them to to make as much money as they want, they can, trumps the right of some people to live, because that's the world we live in. You know, this, this capitalist notion that, that freedom to just like, you know, amass as much wealth as you want is more important than, than the right, you know, of, of people to live in. And, you know, I mean, 30,000 kids under the age of five are dying every day because of this global poverty that is maintained and perpetuated by the policies of the one percent you know this this poli this in other words a lot of times when we get cheap products you know here in the united states is because we're not paying the, the workers enough and even like let's say if, if they're being made in china or in africa or, or in asia whatever asia um basically a lot of that money is not going toward the workers it's going toward toward the rich you know to, toward the owners and so the reason this human will question is so important to the re revolution, to the equality aspect of this revolution, is because it provides a logical, rational, moral basis for the equality. And the idea is that um, if nobody has a free will, then, I mean, we generally understand the implications of understanding that our wills are not free within the context of blame. In other words, like if somebody does something wrong, if we do something wrong, we understand that like, if they don't have a free will, if they were completely compelled, if they couldn't do anything but what they did, then um, we can't rightly blame them, you know. So that's, that's generally how we, we um, you know, apply this question of human will to morality, how philosophers do. but. Very few philosophers, you know, extend that logic to, to the other side of it, meaning that if we can't blame ourselves logically, each other, for what we do wrong, we certainly can't either credit ourselves when we do good, when we, when we do right, because when we do right, that's as equally compelled. It's compelled by the past, by God, by, by the universe, whatever. So, so if we're not going to like, you know, if we're not going to, let's say, punish um, people ourselves as we do wrong when we make mistakes, and that doesn't mean like there is, you know, some utility to deterrence, you know, 
um, punishment as a deterrent. I mean, that can help. And, you know, a lot, a lot of ways it, it's not necessary, but, but, you know, it can help in a lot of ways. But um, if we apply this to... Um, I lost my train of thought. Okay. Um, let me think. All right. It's just the idea is like, you know, this, this Occupy Revolution, um, you know, if we think about how it's going to transpire, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure what's going to happen through the, the fall and winter because, you know, I mean, I'm not going to occupy there. I've got a tent. I'm, I'm psyched. Like in the spring, I want to like go, you know, and camp out at some occupations, you know, like when the weather starts getting warm again. But I have a feeling people, you know, there's like a somebody I know um, who, who's like, he's in the polar bear club. These guys like go, I think, to Coney Island in, <laughs> in the middle of winter and just jump in the water. So there's a lot of people out there that, you know, the weather doesn't scare them that much. So I'm guessing that these, you know, these occupations will, you know, extend through the... Um, through the fall and winter, but then really mushroom all over the country and the world in the spring, summer, and fall of next year, because to a great extent because of the elections 2012, but also because this movement, once it's started, once we have the weather with us and all, is just un unstoppable. Um, so, so then the, uh, the uh, question becomes, what, what spirit are we going to conduct this um, revolution under? Are we going to conduct it under the insane, indictive, um, wrong perspective that human beings have a free will because if we do that we're going to be at each other you know we're going to be at each other um, look what happened in Libya we can take that route or we can like and you know I hope the 1% is wise enough to, to listen to this because it really does affect them if they are if we together and especially they because they control so much of the media are willing to understand if they're fated to understand again because it's not up to them that um, that free will is an illusion, and if if we kind of like really really appreciate the the ramifications, the, what this signifies, then then we can conduct this revolution. Yeah, without without the blame. Then you know that means like you know we got go out to dinner with a one percenter, you know, whatever they go out to dinner with us. Yes, listen, I'm sorry, we're going to have to take a lot of your money, a lot of your power. But, you know, it's not about you. You know, you know, you couldn't do but what you did. This is about just like, you know, allowing people to have good lives, to, to raise kids, to eat, you know, to live. It's not, you know, people, we won't take it personally. That's a good, that's a good theme. I think um, the free will perspective personalizes stuff. Okay, and yeah, that, that, that basically when we ascribe free will to the 1%, it's going to be personal. It's about them as people. But when we remind ourselves that, wait a minute, they're, you know, the way they acted, the greed, the selfishness, what, what they're doing now, they can't help but have acted that way, then we realize, wait a minute, so it's the universe. It's, it's the universal will that's, um, that's causing all this. And, um, and yeah, the, then, then all of a sudden, you know, the... the, the the anger toward that one percent um, evaporates, and their anger—they may be angry toward the ninety-nine percent for thinking that, um, for you know, for daring to think that human life is, is more valuable than their right to, to make money. Because you know? <laughs> they are so deluded. Oh my God! I mean, like now, you know, there there are many people within the one uh, percent who are compassionate, but but as a group. You know, this, this group is like the most dangerous on the planet because they're so self-indulgent and, and so indifferent to, to the plight of the 99%. And, um, and you know, it's so like, so this, this matter of human will involves them also because, like, they, they do tend to blame us. So if they understand that we don't have a uh, free will either, we're just like, you know, these women are just like um, going by the dictates of their hormones of their, you know, biological clock, and these young kids um, are just, like, compelled by the economic conditions that, you know, of joblessness, of, of no future, you know, especially with the future being, you know, stolen from them uh, with, the, with the huge debt, for example, the United States have and our, um, our refusal to do anything about climate change. I mean, these are, these are majorly, um, majorly 
quote unquote blame worthy kinds of things that you could potentially blame a lot of people for you know but again if, if we just understand that um, that everything's causal that free will is an illusion we will um, we'll conduct this this revolution in a much more civil and pleasant way because you know many in the one percent don't get this yet but but this revolution is necessary in other words like with with the changes that are coming about as a result of climate change not in 50 years but over the next decade and two and three um, if we don't start to address it you know in various ways um, it doesn't matter whether you're in the top one percent or the bottom 99 percent it's going to affect you and and now with the political um, you know scenario we're under it's absolutely going to affect you because the 99 percent are going to make sure it affects you <laughs> you know so I mean like we're in this together so um, so yeah this is it's hugely important to understand you know the nature of human will because of um, of all this this is I'm, I'm having you know it may be because I um, this is like the third show I'm taping it may be because this topic is so um, big this is the biggest thing happening it's the biggest thing ever probably a global revolution a peaceful global yeah I want, I want to focus on that actually because like um, well no no basically what I want to say is like all right I um, to the extent that um, that in trying to kind of like relate this the importance of the issue of human will to the Occupy 99% revolution against the 1% to the extent that um, that I'm kind of like tangenting into other areas because this is so huge you know I'm, I'm still trying to wrap myself around this you know basically the rule of 99 of the one percent is over you know their their inordinate wealth at the expense of everyone else is over and the reason I know this also is like um, you know I've studied the history of the depression you know um, FDR got elected in 32 the, the depression I think was like 28 29 whatever and um, you know after that you know there was there was a huge there was a, um, a very very wealthy class back then actually the one percent now are wealthier than the one percent back then were which is like egregious but but you know you had major major changes coming about um, at that time and so this is we're, we're in a very similar time except this is like basically we have learned that you can't allow the rich the one percent to have any advantage over the 99 because what happened was is like you know they instituted a lot of like um, laws back then to to kind of like to lessen the power and the money of the one percent but they didn't go far enough so like you know with the 80s and the Reagan nomics and all this stuff they they basically um, it wasn't just Reagan Clinton too Kennedy um, the, the the rich just started accumulating wealth again and as they did that they started accumulating power and so yeah basically the history tells us that um, that we did it before we have to do it again it's so much more important now so we will do it and and um, and I think what I want to say also is that um, this is such a cool revolution because it's peaceful it can be completely peaceful I mean like um, yeah um, we basically have to kind of um, get the message out there that it's not the police against the people it's not the government against the people it's the policies the money and the power of the one percent you know against the people and so um, so yeah as we uh, all right I, hook, I gotta hook it back to we've got about three minutes left I've got to bring it really back to this um, this issue of human will we've got you know it's all fate it's not up to us so let's not blame ourselves if we don't do this and let's hope we get this right but if between now and next year our world makes major strides in understanding that human will is causal and not free I guarantee you that's going to make have major effects on the nature and um, and workings and outcome well not so much the outcome but just the workings of this revolution in other words it's going to be so much more peaceful and civil and and, and friendly and, and and blameless you know um, without the attribution without 
are condemning, you know, these people, these, the one percent, for their greed and their callousness and indifference. You know, if we can just like go about the the, the business of, you know, basically doing what we have to do, just uh, redistributing the wealth, um, just removing their political power, um, creating jobs, addressing the um, the climate, healthcare, all that stuff. If we we go about that with a causal world perspective that will benefit everyone, including the top 1%. They don't realize it yet, but, um, yeah, because, like, see, I mean, like, with the top 1%, for example, like, um, it's not, you know, we've, we've created such an amazingly competitive world that it's, like, you know, having all that money just doesn't really, um, I mean, I know this from, from my happiness work. You know, I did 140 episodes of The Happiness Show, and one of the major findings is more money above the poverty line does not make you happier, and more power doesn't make you happier. So, like, they'll probably end up being a lot happier um, once this, um, once they don't have so much money and power. You know, money corrupts, power corrupts. Okay. Um, all right, we've got less than a minute. So I just want to do a quick commercial. All right, every Wednesday night, 11 p.m., Manhattan Neighborhood Network Channel 56, okay, from 11 to 11.30, a live television call-in show. The Messenger and I um, are there. We're explaining to Manhattan and the rest of the world on the Internet that free will is an illusion. The show is called Myth of Free Will. Okay, so, you know, check it out. Call us up. Just tell us why you think free will is an illusion or why you think that we have free will, and then we'll explain why we don't. All right, well, that's it for today. Um, hope you had a good day, and I guess I'll see you next time on Exploring Illusion of Free Will. Thanks.